This is a CBC Podcast. Dante, Anine, Bujou, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. The federal election is just around the corner, so we're rolling up our sleeves and getting political. On the show today, we're talking about Indigenous issues and what's at stake when voters head to the polls. The last federal election saw the highest Indigenous voter turnout ever. We heard a lot about the most important relationship, Canada's relationship with Indigenous people. But that was four years ago. Today on Unreserved, how far have we come since the last election? And where are we headed? The last federal election in 2015 saw a large increase in the Indigenous vote. Alberta had the biggest increase of Indigenous voters showing up to the polls. But this time, experts say that might not happen. The CBC's Stephanie Dubois joins me from Edmonton with more. Hello, Stephanie. Hi, Rosanna. So 2015 was... a uh, historic year in terms of the number of on-reserve votes cast. Can you Mm -hmm. break it down for us by how much exactly? Well, so there's a lot of numbers, and since no one really loves numbers, I'll keep it short, I promise. But as you might remember, 2015 also saw one of the highest voter turnouts in decades at 68%. And Election Canada says that in the last federal election, there was an on-reserve turnout at polling divisions of 61.5%. That's a 14% jump from 2011, when the on-reserve turnout rate was about 47%. And of course, Alberta had the largest increase in on-reserve polling divisions than any other place in Canada. More than 24,000 people voted on Alberta reserves in 2015, more than double the number of people who voted on reserve in 2011. Manitoba and Saskatchewan also had relatively large increases in the number of on-reserve voters. Wow, that is a lot of numbers. Yeah, it's quite... (laughs) (laughs) So why was the on-reserve turnout so high? Well, you know, experts say there could be several reasons why the voter turnout on-reserve was so high last time. Um, Pam Palmeter is a Mi'kmaq lawyer and chair of Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. She says before the last election, Indigenous people were motivated to vote out Stephen Harper's Conservatives. She says some of the government's decisions, or in her opinion, lack thereof, motivated a lot of First Nations people to cast a ballot. There was a huge, huge impetus for people to get him out. And we had, you know, the, the polar opposite, at least at the time, Prime Minister Trudeau promising, you know, that there would be no relationship more important than the one with Indigenous people, that it would be based on a respect for rights, there would be no legislation imposed on us without our consent, and so on and so forth. Basically said the counter opposite of everything Harper said. So there was a real incentive for those inclined to vote or thinking about voting to go out and vote and try to make a difference in the election. Now, it's important to note that Elections Canada, they've been trying to, um, for the last year now, been working with Indigenous communities to try and encourage communities to come out and vote for this federal election. So hopefully we can see some numbers increase again this year. Mm. So let's broaden this a bit and address what parties have been promising this election. Where do people fit in within their plans? Yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, Many of the people I spoke to have mixed feelings about discussing the platforms and whether they do have policies for Indigenous people in Canada. Pam Palmer says she combed through all of the federal party's platforms and found it very hard to find party promises for Indigenous people. But, of course, not everyone agrees with that statement. I spoke to Naomi Sayers, an Anishinaabe lawyer from Garden River First Nation, and she says it's really important that we don't try and classify certain issues as specific, quote, Indigenous issues. Platforms are are a strange beast to begin with. Because you want to appeal to a lot of people and you want to make sure that people feel heard and feel seen when they look at the platform. So there's a lot of issues that apply broadly and there's a lot of targeted issues, especially with Indigenous issues. But people have to start thinking uh, at these platforms as not just non-Indigenous or Indigenous, but that Indigenous issues are present throughout. So it is important to note that there are some specifics in party platforms. Uh, The Liberals, NDP, and the Green Party, for example, have all committed to eliminating boil water advisories and have said they would adhere to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The NDP and the Green Party have also committed to paying the full amount ordered by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal to Indigenous children who were taken from their homes in the 2000s. So keeping that in mind, what do experts think will happen in this election? 
Well, Rosanna, we all wish we had that crystal ball, but <laughs> since we don't, <laughs> um, I asked the pros what they thought. And many of the experts I spoke to said that they think this year's election has people voting for very different reasons. Uh, Palmer says that Justin Trudeau failed Indigenous people in his four years in office. And she figures she's not alone in thinking that. Many Indigenous people don't feel like many of those promises have been fulfilled over the last four years, which could affect the turnout at the polls. This election, again, presents a very different circumstance because you have a scenario after four years where Prime Minister Trudeau made lots of promises of things he would do, and he's broken the majority of those promises. So that's left a lot of First Nations people very disillusioned um, because they really thought that Trudeau meant what he said when he said he was going to do all of these things. And she said that there is a chance that the turnout numbers may go down and that we may not see a dramatic increase because of what she calls disillusionment. But, of course, not everyone agrees. Some do think that there will be high turnout at on-reserve polling divisions. And I spoke to Marlene Poitras, the Assembly of First Nations Alberta Regional Chief. She thinks the youth vote could account for many of the votes cast in this election, especially in Alberta. People are more informed. People are tired of status quo. They want change. The youth movement is, you know, picking up speed and we're, we're out there supporting them and, you know, in terms of protecting the environment, but also ensuring that First Nation peoples are well taken care of now and in the future. Fascinating. I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll have to wait until October 21st. <laughs> oh, the pressure. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this, Stephanie. Thanks so much. That's Stephanie Dubois, a reporter with CBC Edmonton. You can find more information on where the parties stand on Indigenous issues at cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. We're talking about elections, politics, and the Indigenous vote on the show today. Still ahead. We went from the most important relationship ever to tab number five, if you click on the electronic platform on the Liberal website. Author and Toronto Star columnist Tani Talaga, Hill Times columnist Rose LeMay, and York University professor Dr. Brock Patanawanaquit will join me for a panel on politics. That's coming up in just a few minutes. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. For some Canadians, deciding who to vote for is a big enough challenge. For some Indigenous people, choosing whether to vote at all is a completely different struggle. Do you choose to vote and legitimize a system that you couldn't even actually participate in 60 years ago without giving up Indian status? Or do you choose not to vote and risk even less representation for issues that matter to you. It's a debate that Nipawika Kanusit has had with himself and others for a while now. My traditional name is Standing Wolf Paw One Who Is Tall, Nipawi Mahikan Misit Kaganusit. I come from the Suck Cree First Nation in northern Alberta. I was born and raised in Prince George, where I'm currently residing, Clay Clay Tanate Territory. And I'm planning on not voting this election cycle. My family is one of the head families, uh, one of the families that was uh, the treaty negotiators and the signers of Treaty 8. As a direct descendant of treaty signatories from Treaty 8, And this applies for all Indigenous people who are from treaty territories or who have governance systems. Uh, We are under no obligation whatsoever to participate in Canada's electoral system. I'm not voting in this election because as an Indigenous nationalist, it is contradictory to our position of Indigenous people having complete control over the social, economic, environmental, cultural, and political aspects of our lives. We have our own system. And so for myself, that's why I choose not to participate or legitimize the colonial system is because we don't have to. We have the right to refuse participation. And in saying that, too, uh, because I know this is something that comes up when whenever anyone says they're not going to vote is, oh, well, if you don't vote, uh, you don't have a right to complain. Well, as Indigenous people, absolutely we do. 
because, again, we're not obligated to participate in the Canadian electoral system, as well as the fact that regardless of whether or not we participate, it doesn't negate the fiduciary obligations that the Crown owes the Indigenous nations. For those folks who are undecided, or even those folks who feel that they want to participate, that's your right. You know, we... Again, just as we have the right to not participate in the Canadian electoral process and the system, we also have the right to participate. And if we live in a dem democratic society, if we live in a society where we're supposed to have all these rights and freedoms, then uh, nobody, not even other Indigenous people, could tell other Indigenous people what to do and what not to do. That was Nipawika Kanusit on why he won't be voting in the federal election. While some may choose not to vote, what if you can't vote because you're not old enough, but you still want your voice heard? We are unstoppable. Another world is possible. That's the sound of youth marching in Inuvik. They've been marching to raise awareness about climate change. Not just during the global climate strike. They've been marching every Friday since March, while school is in session. The students carry signs and chant. We are Many of these youth aren't eligible to vote, but they want federal leaders to listen. Ariel Lute is from further north than Inuvik. She's 17 from the Arctic coastal community of Tuktoyaktuk, and she's worried about her home. Coastal erosion is becoming so bad in Ariel's community that some homes are being relocated. We're going to have to actually move our town if climate change becomes more and more real. Is that true? Like, we're wondering, is this going to come to a point in the future where our culture is going to be affected like that, or our houses even? 19-year-old Nathan Kaptana is also part of the group. He's the only one eligible to vote this year, and it will be his first time voting in a federal election. Hopefully um, we get the funding to protect our land because the water is like increased. Like this year was just maybe like maybe four, four, four to six meters just from three storms. Nathan says he might be young, but even he has noticed differences in the community in his lifetime. Climate change is accelerating, he says, and water levels are rising. Although most of them aren't eligible to vote in the federal election, these young people in Inuvik are going to keep marching and keep drawing attention to issues of climate change in the north. Thanks to CBC's Mackenzie Scott for bringing us this story. We need all young people to succeed, especially Indigenous young people. Uh, and we have made changes, we have made investments. One of them That's Liberal candidate Catherine McKenna at a recent all-candidates meeting in Ottawa Centre. Questions about Indigenous policies, reconciliation, and the treatment of Indigenous children have come up in urban ridings during the federal campaign. And next to some key election concerns like climate change and affordability, Indigenous issues are among the major topics for party leaders at the English language debate. The CBC's Julie Ireton looked into how these issues have been resonating in eastern Ontario during the campaign. Macroeconomics textbooks are open to the day's lesson. Four young women sit at a long table in front of laptops. They're helping each other with some new concepts. They live and study in Ottawa, but Nunavut is home. So my name is Stepisa Tatuni. I'm 21, and I'm from Oxford, Nunavut. She's in the third year of the Academic and Career Development Program at Nunavut Sivanuksavut. It's a post-secondary initiative for about 50 Inuit and Northern students in Ottawa. These women are preparing for future careers, and they're paying attention to the current campaign. Are you going to vote? Yes. Do you know who you want to vote for? Um... I'm stuck between, can I say the names? Whatever you want, absolutely. <laughs> uh, the Liberals or NDP, okay. not the Conservatives. How much do you think your vote matters? It matters a lot. 
a lot of people say, oh, my vote doesn't count. But then when you see, like, the polls or, like, the numbers, they're, like, close. So it's like your vote could matter. And I think it's really important that everyone votes on election day. For her, the big issues include the housing crisis in the north and the cost of food. My name is Cecile Lyle, and I'm from Tel Aviv, Nunavut, in the Khidrmit region. I feel like this election, it's very refreshing because we see... Um, indigenous issues and the betterment of the people really at the forefront of each of their campaigns and a lot of it has to do with the youth. Cecile Lyle is relishing the opportunity to vote. I remember my first time voting the first year that I was old enough to vote and I was so excited and it's just something that has always been important for myself. It's very empowering to be able to sit in that booth and really feel like you're making a difference, not just for your community, but for Canada as a whole. Like these women, many Indigenous young people are moving to urban areas, some for school or work. At the time of the 2016 census, more than 42,000 First Nations, Métis and Inuit called Ottawa home. In fact, outside of Nunavut, Ottawa has the largest Inuit population. It includes students, artists, bureaucrats, workers at non-governmental agencies, and people receiving health treatments. In Nunavut, this time around, candidates running for the NDP, Liberals and Conservatives are all Inuit and they're all women. So having someone from our communities, um, it's very inspiring because a young girl at home right now, she can picture herself running for federal elections, maybe someday running for prime minister. And it's, it's so inspiring to see that. A ceremony at the Canadian Museum of History honours the thousands of children who died in residential schools. Heartfelt ceremony, the somberness. You know, you've uh, you've acknowledged over 4,000 children that have died in the residential school system. Uh, you could feel the heaviness. Perry Belgard is the chief of the Assembly of First Nations. It's uh, it's part of Canada's dark history, dark chapter, and um, it's to acknowledge them, and remember them. Youth are still a focus for Belgard. The fastest growing segment of Canada is Canada's population, our young First Nations men and women. So I've always said to governments, invest in human capital in training and education. You're going to get huge returns on investment in the future. Canada got an aging workforce. You got a skilled labor shortage. There's, there's a, a pool of people that should be invested in right now. He believes change is happening. It's moving in the right direction. There's but there's still much to do. But progress doesn't mean parity. We still have a way to go. There has to be continued investments in the social determinants of, of health, investments in water, investment in housing, proper housing, education, infrastructure. And these are all areas the Liberal, NDP and Green parties have pledged to work on and resolve. But I want to start by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Algonquin peoples and to them, Miigwech. At the debate earlier this week, Elizabeth May gave a nod to the unceded territory of the Algonquins. That land includes the site of the Canadian Museum of History and Parliament Hill. May and the Greens have an Algonquin candidate in this campaign. Everyone knows that the Green Party of Canada has a great environmental platform. But what Lorraine Reckmans is the only candidate in eastern Ontario who identifies as Indigenous. She's a member of the Serpent River First Nation. As a small business owner, I believe... Reckmans is looking for votes in Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Indigenous youth are ending up in urban areas. And we have to make sure that we have services to support them in that transition. Because a lot of people move for employment opportunities. I think we do have a responsibility to make sure there's culturally significant services for these kids. The question was about fighting Indigenous kids in court. It was about the Human Rights Tribunal that has had to make multiple non-compliance orders. Emily Tamman, an Ottawa lawyer, is running for the NDP in Ottawa Centre. Both the NDP and the Green Party say they would comply with the tribunal's decision. It calls for compensation for First Nations children who've been taken from their homes and communities. Ten years of litigation to finally get a ruling, to finally get a ruling from the Human Rights Tribunal that Canada is discriminating against First Nations, Indigenous and Métis kids by underfunding education, by underfunding health care, and the child welfare system is a national disgrace. 
Uh, it makes me embarrassed to be a Canadian, and as a mother, I find it extremely painful. Tamman says the NDP would comply with the order, but the decision could cost the federal government billions of dollars. The Trudeau government has decided to challenge the tribunal's decision in federal court. So would conservative leader Andrew Scheer if his party was in power. This decision uh, will have massive, uh, huge ramifications for several uh, aspects of the way the federal government provides services to Indigenous Canadians. It also is uh, a very large, significant uh, settlement amount. And I believe that when you're dealing with these types of important public policy issues, uh, that it is legitimate to say that it should be reviewed. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back here in Iqaluit. Justin Trudeau was campaigning in Iqaluit on Tuesday. I try to get to our beautiful north as often as I can. Meanwhile, down south, Inuit students at this post-secondary program in Ottawa's lower town are watching the campaign unfold. My name is Julian Chavil. Um, I'm 21. She plans to vote and can't imagine why young people wouldn't. We're more educated. I feel like um, people should listen to, I mean, like, you know, the candidates should listen to youth because we're more educated. We know what's going on. And as the majority of our students are just graduating high school, and this year is the first time that they're eligible to vote. Cecil Lyle says in this week's classes, they're talking about the election. And just to hear them talk about how excited they are and like, oh, who am I going to vote for? And talking. About Lyle's encouraged to see Indigenous issues coming up in city debates. I would really like to see this um, momentum um, continue. I feel personally that a lot of the change that we need in our communities needs to start within the home. And to have that, we need to have um, homes that are healthy and thriving in order for the youth and the children to thrive in the future. So. I'm Julie Ayrton in Ottawa. And I hope that's happening throughout the territory. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosetta Deerchild. Election Day is October 21st. That's when Canadians across the country will head to the polls and cast their ballots in the federal election. So it seems like the perfect time to pull together a panel to talk about the campaign, issues affecting Indigenous voters, and how the parties are courting those votes. Tanya Talega is a columnist with the Toronto Star and an award-winning author. She is in Anishinaabe and joins me from Thunder Bay. Welcome. Hi. Dr. Brock Batanawanaquit is a professor and a program coordinator of Indigenous Studies at York University. He's also a research fellow with the Indigenous-led think tank, the Yellowhead Institute. Brock is Anishinaabe from Whitefish River First Nation. He's joining us from Toronto. Thanks for being here, Brock. Hello. And Rose LeMay is the CEO of the Indigenous Reconciliation Group and writes a column for the Hill Times, which is a paper that covers federal political news in Canada. She's Tlingit from the West Coast. She's in Ottawa today. Hello. Glad to be here. Now, in 2015, at the center of Justin Trudeau's campaign was what he called, quote, the most important relationship, end quote, and that's Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. Tanya, you recently wrote a column about this in which you said, what a change four years can make. What did you mean by that? Well, we seem to have completely fallen off the radar in this election. You know, it's really quite incredible, too, what has happened over the last four years. We've seen so much go wrong with the liberal promises. We see laws that are passed that don't have enough of our voices and our opinions. I can point to the child welfare legislation as well that isn't properly funded or the language legislation that was supposed to revitalize Indigenous languages. And as somebody told me, I don't think anybody's language will be revitalized from this piece of legislation. There are so many half-baked promises that, and then, you know, we've got the entire scandal with Jody Wilson Raybould. I don't even know where to, to begin. You know, you just kind of throw your hands up with the Liberals right now and say, where are you? Hmm. In the recent English language debate, the section dedicated to Indigenous issues largely turned into a discussion about pipelines. Let's hear a clip of that. 
And you want to talk about getting pipelines built? The, you've canceled two pipelines, and the one you bought, you can't build. You've let tens of thousands of people in Alberta and Saskatchewan down, and you have failed, and you have failed to recognize that Indigenous communities so, are I, hurt by I, this as I well. I am accepting right. the fact that I'm going to be attacked for uh, not you. building pipelines from some Thank and you. for building yeah. pipelines well, for others. That's money. Conservative yeah. leader Andrew Shear speaking to Justin Trudeau. So, Rose, are Indigenous issues getting enough attention? Well, I guess I'd have to say after the English debate, no. I'm surprised there were no Indigenous reporters on scene, that there should have been an Indigenous reporter, and I love Susan Delacour's work, but this was a time to actually highlight for media and reconciliation the involvement of Indigenous. So number one, I'd say no on just a process, structural point. I'm kind of concerned, I guess, that this whole topic turned into pipelines, Mm -hmm. and that worries me around Canada's and Canadians' view of what role Indigenous play right now in this country. And unfortunately, it blurs the relationship that we could be having between Indigenous and non-Indigenous by wrapping around this one very divisive debate. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hoping for more. What does that look like? I really don't know. But it seems the relationship is not improving at this point. It's It's interesting, too, that um, this is the most important issue for everyone. Clearly, I mean, if you've got to come up with one Indigenous issue and they're talking about pipelines, that's a different way of seeing the world than we see it, right? I mean, clearly it is is an issue for us and consent is an issue and consultation and, and all of those things that never really truly happen. But... Is this the number one issue that's on every Indigenous person's mind? Pipelines? Is it? Is it? I'm going to say there are some other bigger issues like equity and the rights of our children to gain access to education and to health care. And also, too, the recent ruling that we just saw the $2 billion in compensation going to children living in reserve communities born after 2006, who were unwillfully apprehended from their homes. And that has been uh, challenged now by the Liberal government. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue. It is indeed. Brock, you've been keeping a close eye on federal elections for years now. Looking back to 2015, what are the biggest changes that you've noticed in the profile of Indigenous issues? Well, I think the difference that we had in the last election is the Liberals, when the campaign got underway, they were in a distant, relatively distant third place. And certainly the expectation was not that they were about to form a majority government that that really happened during the campaign and so i think leading up to the election uh justin trudeau was making promises that realistically he never intended or never expected to have to carry out as as a prime minister and specifically i'm thinking of how he promised Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, all the calls to action would be implemented. Similarly, he said his government would implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So just on those two promises alone, I think he set the bar very high for Indigenous people's expectations. And that's part of the reason we saw unprecedented turnout among Indigenous voters. And uh, there was a a recent poll done by Enveronics for uh, the Aboriginal People's Television Network, and it noted that there seems to be almost a a 50% drop in terms of support for the Liberals among Indigenous voters between 2015 and the current election. Tanya, you wrote a column for The Star in September called, Why Are Federal Political Leaders So Quiet on Indigenous Concerns? So why are they? Out of sight, out of mind, you know, I I think about that. I think that they are just not, again, getting what the true issues are that many of our communities are facing. We haven't been anywhere with Indigenous issues as far as I can see in this election. You know, I'm reading through the platforms right now, and I just got finished. uh, Last week I read the Liberal platform. Now I'm reading the NDP platform. And it's so interesting, you know. I mean, we went from the most important relationship ever to, um, you know, tab number five, if you click on the electronic platform on the Liberal website. You know, it's just it's completely different. Now we're we're only about 11 pages in this 200 page platform document as well. And the promises are basically, oh, right, we're going to do this. Oh, right, we're going to do that. You know, they're continuation of the broken promises from before. 
Mm. It's really quite interesting for me to see how we've gone from 2015 and the time right before 2015 talking about all of these important issues facing our communities to not talking about them at all. And, you know, the debate we see that the number one thing on everyone's mind in the mainstream media is pipelines. We got a lot more issues to talk about than that, specifically the equity of our children. Mm-hmm. Brock, I heard you uh, agreeing there. Oh, yeah, very much so. I, I think there has been a missed opportunity for many of the political parties to engage Indigenous peoples, especially as as we mentioned earlier, there's been this significant drop in support for the Liberal Party. So presumably some of those votes, uh, they're up for grabs. And I think we definitely saw it in the debate, uh, the English language debate in particular, where the Green Party was definitely making overtures, Whether and people pointed this out, that you had Elizabeth May uh, do a land acknowledgement in terms of her opening statement. And similarly, she she would often make reference uh, specifically to Indigenous issues. So I, I do think the Green Party, the New Democrats for sure, have made overtures. Uh, there, there was kind of the bizarre moment where uh, you ended up seeing uh, Maxime Bernier saying that his People's Party would essentially bring in the white paper is what he's promising, is like the end of collective land ownership on reserves. And essentially it's like a sped-up version of what the Conservatives have been touting. So there is some engagement, but I would say there's not a lot to inspire Indigenous peoples to come out to the polls, especially for those who have been following the trends, which is that the Greens and NDP up to this point have been fighting for distant third at best. And really, it seems to be a heavyweight match between the Conservatives and the Liberals, which coincidentally are the only two parties that have ever formed government in the history of the country. And they have, like, respectively terrible records in terms of Indigenous policies and their treatment of Indigenous peoples, nations, and families. So I I think that's part of the frustration for Indigenous peoples if they're contemplating voting. I'd like to play a clip um, for you now. Ava Hill is chief of the Six Nations of the Grand River in Ontario. Uh, Six Nations is the largest First Nations reserve in Canada by population, over 27,000 people, with 13,000 people living there. And in 2015, uh, in that election, fewer than 900 people from that community voted. Chief Hill says voting in a federal election is a personal decision. Here she is now. I'm not encouraging people to vote one way or the other. I mean, it's up to them. You know, I haven't even made up my own mind whether I will or not. Um, You know, I know that there are some writings throughout the country where the First Nations vote or the Indigenous vote can make a big difference. And I think people are doing that. And uh, um, here, traditionally, uh, you know, we we still maintain the position that we have sovereignty and, and we're a nation. You know, we've heard the government talk about nation-to-nation relationships. Well, we are a nation. We're the Haudenosaunee. uh, And so why do you take part in another nation system? We wouldn't want them taking part in our system. And I think that's part of it, leading to the whole nation-to-nation relationship, is having that respect. That's what the two-row wampum is about, that we go down the river side by side, but we don't interfere in each other's business. That was Chief Ava Hill of Six Nations talking to CBC host Craig Norris. Now, Rose, what are your thoughts on why some Indigenous voters might decide not to cast a ballot in the federal election? Well, I can see Ava Hill's point around that the number of First Nations within her community probably doesn't have a lot of impact in that riding. But then I think about Nunavut, where there are Inuk running as candidates. I think about how much discussion has been going on in that riding and how many Inuit uh, will be voting and how much they care about the election. And that's the interesting part about politics in Indigenous communities is the immense amount of diversity that occurs from east to west to north to south, from First Nations to Inuit to Métis on and off reserve. Uh, And so I'm not surprised that there's probably First Nations, Inuit and Métis across the whole spectrum, whether or not we will vote or not, what impact it will have, and and every other question we could possibly ask. Mm. Tani, how do you respond to this idea of Indigenous voters opting out? Until we see the system changing, until we have a completely different system of governance, I think that we have to get in there and try and 
do what we can from within. Now, I know this did not work out whatsoever for Jody Wilson-Raybould, but, you know, I look at the fact that uh, Chief Grassy Narrows Chief Rudy Turtle is running in uh, his riding because of um, a lack of promises fulfilled in the Grassy Narrows area, you know, due to the mercury poisoning in the water. And um, I also see in Thunder Bay, you know, we have um, the former Deputy Grand Chief of Nishinaabeaski Nation, Anna Betty at Chnipaneskum. She's running here too because there are so many issues in this this area and in this riding concerning our kids and concerning, you know, what's what's happened in the city and in this area. There are real concerns that we need to sort of get in there and do what we can while we wait for other things to happen, you know, and other things being a more equitable, fairer governance system because the system that we've had in place for the last 150 years, as we know, isn't fair or equitable. Here's a counterpoint to that last clip. We heard Ryan Beardy, who is Cree and Soto from Lake St. Martin First Nation, was on The Current recently. Here's what he had to say about why he is planning to vote on October 21st. Well, I wouldn't be really honest with you. I didn't think my vote mattered. I was, uh, I spent a large portion of my life uh, with in and out of the criminal justice system and uh, affected by a lot of the policies that, that governed me in there. Um, I saw a lot of human rights abuses, a lot of disproportions, a lot of things that need to be addressed. So uh, um, I got my high school diploma in the penitentiary and decided to uh, see if I could do something about it. I got ended up in university studying political science at the University of Winnipeg for the last two years. I understand that uh, my ancestors fought for the right to vote and we were just allowed to vote without disenfranchisement in 1960. So here I am to continue that fight. I know my vote will make a difference and uh, Indigenous vote will make a difference as well. Brock, how do you respond to what he said? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm sympathetic to both of the, the clips that you played by Ryan Beardy and Chief Hill. I... I think for a lot of Indigenous peoples, there isn't the same political history that Haudenosaunee people have in terms of uh, the the participation or the decision to not participate in provincial and federal politics. Uh, that's, that's definitely not true for all Indigenous peoples. Uh, and I think one of the concerns I have is what is the outcome of not voting or not participating? And uh, something that I, I'm talking about with my, my Indigenous Studies course this week is that one of the first acts of the British Columbia Parliament when when the legislature came into being was to disenfranchise all Indigenous people who lived in what is now British Columbia. And that was because Indigenous people were three to four times the population of the incoming settler group. And so the settlers knew that allowing Indigenous people to vote was going to disrupt their plans for colonization. And so I really think it's a personal choice. And I, and that's why I, I have tremendous respect for people um, who are on either side of voting or non-voting. And in some ways, I think non-voting doesn't fully describe the commitment that Haudenosaunee people have because they are investing their, their energy into organizing, whether it's a traditional longhouse government, which Six Nations has both, a traditional government and then also a band council as well. So I think there's lots of different ways for people to become politically engaged. Mm-hmm. I hear a lot from uh, a lot of Indigenous people, Ryan was, was one of them who mentioned this, um, that voting is really an emotionally uh, charged uh, practice even. We, we talk about when we got the vote, we talk about how those two sets of systems are separated, how we have a chief and council. Why do you think that, that it is so emotionally charged for Indigenous people? The The emotional part, I think, is that there's a concern of Indigenous people being pulled too far into the settler ways of doing things. I think that's something, and I, I think I'm going back hundreds of years, where there was an awareness that if we drifted too far from our own communities, our own values, uh, we put ourselves at risk. And I think that is part of the concern once people start identifying as Canadian first, as opposed to indigenous of specific nations, then I think that that's where it can get emotional. And sometimes you can, because it goes to the core of people's identity. Like, are you, are you Anishinaabe? Are you Nehiao? Um, or are you Canadian? And which, because there's been so much conflict 
between our respective nations, then to some extent, people are confronted with a choice. Like, who are you one of them or are you one of us? And it, it, it leads to some really, I think, uh, like you mentioned, emotionally charged conversations or debates. Rose, any thoughts? I think there is a level of emotion that occurs when First Nations, Inuit, and Métis choose to vote. Uh, I am going to vote. I've voted um, quite strongly for for voting. But you know what? For me, when, on October 21st, when I go to vote, and I'll be standing at the booth, and I'm not entirely sure who I'm actually going to vote for, and that's quite unique for me. And I'm going to be thinking about the things that the government has done that have worked out for me in the past four years, And I'm going to be thinking the things that really didn't and the things that didn't work out for me. I always think, is that because I'm First Nations and does colonization continue? I applied on the 60s scoop as a survivor. And uh, it's it's going to be emotional for me because when I stand in that booth and think the amount, the sum of money at most that I might receive from this government and from the Liberal Party and from the Supreme Court, from the court system and all of it thrown together. And unfortunately, in my head, it all gets mixed up on voting day. I'm going to think about other settlements and other non-Indigenous who went through potentially worse, better, not so much, I don't want to get into a trauma game, who received a fairly significant settlement. And actually, that's that's going to be on my mind when I vote. So yes, there is always some emotion going on for me. And I would guess that for many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, politics is not just the theory or, or or the study it's it's a very much of a day-to-day lift experience around can i maintain my identity today in a very colonized country she's absolutely right you know um i think that uh, we all think of those those things and we think of our families when we go and we stand in that ballot box and try and figure out which is the party and the candidate which won't be as bad as the others you know um and the reality though is that we're we're not sending anybody back too right i mean like we're we're all here and we've got to we've got to figure this out and what's the way to do that you know the the colonial system hasn't worked there needs to be a, a different system that's created and made. Um, But for right now, until we achieve equity and difference, I think that we we have to to make that choice and we have to go to the ballot box and and try and figure out which one won't do us the most harm. Mm -hmm. Arguably, one of the most recognizable Indigenous MPs out there is Jody Wilson-Raybould. She served as Minister of Justice and the Attorney General for the Liberal Cabinet until she was expelled by the party in the fallout over the SNC-Lavalin affair. Recently, Wilson Raybould spoke to CBC's Laura Lynch about why she got into politics. Let's take a listen to that. You know, I had the the great honor of being a regional chief in British Columbia for over six years and was confronted with challenges in terms of advancing solutions that Indigenous peoples have come up with over many, many years around self-determination and self-government that our voices weren't being heard by the previous government. And when I had the opportunity to meet Justin Trudeau, I had a level of frustration that led me to decide to run as a member of parliament and why I did. There's a lot of reasons, but in particular to Indigenous issues, was to create the space for Indigenous peoples in this country to um, be self-determining. That was Jody Wilson-Raybould talking about why she got into mainstream politics. Rose, do you think we'll see more Indigenous people going into federal politics out of frustration or out of the desire to have Indigenous rights brought to the forefront? I'm going to take a stand and say yes, I think we will see more Indigenous people running for federal, provincial and territorial politics. I'm interested to see actually more on the provincial territorial side because I think this is where change can happen a lot quicker. Uh, Going back to the discussion around uh, Trudeau's promises to implement the TRC calls to action and UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, BC is going to do this. BC right now is working towards legislating UN DRIP, and that's an amazing, amazing step. And I think this happens more at a provincial territorial level. I'm not entirely sure, but it would appear that Ottawa bureaucracy is somewhat resistant to that kind of change. And so let's do the change where we actually can make the change quicker if only that 
it needs to happen as quick as we can possibly do it. Mm. Brock, there's a long-standing uh, recognition that the current political system does not adequately represent Indigenous peoples. Are there other options that we can examine, look at, adopt? Yeah, I don't think any are really on the sort of political radar right now. Uh, one of the uh, considerations, this is going back over 20 years now to the RCAP report, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. There was one uh, recommendation of having a, a first people's house, uh, sort of a, a third level of government similar to the House of Commons in the Senate. And it would be specific to issues, legislative issues that would affect Indigenous communities. And it was it was quite vague. It was a general idea at the time, and it really hasn't caught on. There doesn't seem to be a, a widespread interest on either the, the settler side or on Indigenous side to, to have that type of a model. And in many ways, the national organizations kind of informally do this in terms of the advocacy that they provide, whether it's through Inuit Tapadi Kanatami, the Métis National Council, or the Assembly of First Nations. Certainly the Native Women's Association of Canada as well has often come in and made, uh, you know, policy critiques. So I think we have an informal system that operates that way. In terms of having more uh, Indigenous parliamentarians, that is something that uh, the Trudeau government did attempt to do. There was uh, several prominent Indigenous senators that were appointed uh, since he became prime minister. So I think that's been another way there's been an attempt to get more Indigenous perspectives into parliament, but definitely it's uh, it's still massively dominated by settler interests. Now, we're almost out of time, but before we wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you to leave us with any final thoughts. What are you watching for in the final days before the election? Rose, I'll ask you first. In the final days before the election, I'm going to be looking for the party leaders and the parties to be talking more about Indigenous inclusion, not just diversity, but Indigenous inclusion, that First Nations, Inuit and Métis are seen to have a role that is beyond just yes or no to pipelines, but actually a reflection on their contribution to the country and the importance of maintaining that relationship. It, do I, am I looking for promises with numbers? No, no, because I'm, I'm actually looking more for the principle. I'm not necessarily looking for numbers, but I need to see them doing this more, more than just a lip service to it. Brock, final thoughts? Yeah, I think I, my hope is certainly that it's not a majority government because, again, that's with the centralization of power. I would I would be hoping for some kind of scenario where the political parties have to work together and they're on a short leash that there could be another election imminently. And I think that's one of the best ways to make sure that Canadian politicians behave fairly. And Tanya, finally, what will you be keeping an eye on as we head into the polls? Leadership, humanity, and truth. You know, I'm looking to see a, a party and I'm looking for a leader that can show that they can actually lead and they can be honest about what they can deliver and why they are delivering it. You know, when I think about, we, we didn't talk about uh, the blackface scandal at all, but when I think about that and I think about the issues of race, I think that that's something that's dominated this election, but it's something that the mainstream hasn't talked about very much other than at the very superficial level. Level. But, you know, we've been talking about things like UNDRIP. We've been talking about the the need to get more of our voices at the table and not just as a critique, but actually there formally and having some sort of power. I'm looking for a party that's going to deliver that. Tanya, thank you very much for being here today. Miigwech. Rose. Thank you. And Brock. Thank you, everyone. Tanya Talega is a columnist with the Toronto Star. Dr. Brock Patanawanaquit is a professor at York University. And Rose LeMay is a columnist for The Hill Times. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community culture and conversation. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Zoe Tennant, Kyle Muzika, and Anna Lazowski. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. Ego say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.